<laughs> Father, the knowledge of your word is wisdom. And the wisdom of your word is the fear of God. For your word does declare that the beginning of all wisdom is the fear of God. So, Father, please, may we be wise with the power of your word. May we be strong in the weakness of our flesh and the strength of your spirit. May your word teach us tonight. May as we learn your word, Holy Spirit, we invite you to tell us whatever you want. Not a message from me, God, but a, an unction from you. A, a movement by the power of your Holy Spirit to teach us the things that we ought to know. May there be some here that need a word of encouragement. God, encourage them. May some that are here need a word of exhortation, rebuke, correction. Whatever it is that your word needs to say, God, we literally unzip our spirit. Unzip our flesh. Let your spirit speak to ours. Like little chirping birds, feed us, Holy Spirit. You're the only one that can do it. Without you, it's a waste. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We're going to cover two chapters tonight, and a lot of it is story-based. Very little on the message side. But again, there is so much to, to glean and to understand, and I'll try to go quick, because there's a lot of ground to cover. But in going with the story, Israel has decided that they no longer want to be ruled by God. They've decided to be ruled by a king. Let me show you the difference between what we have here. Oh my goodness, that's not very really good. You see this? You, you got that right now? Thanks. <laughs> To the pure, all things are pure. Cut it out. <laughs> you see, in Old Testament times, this was God, and this is how the people lived, inside the framework of the Old Testament rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. Now, it's reversed. This is God, and this is the person. And God now takes up residence inside that person to live and to move. Christ in you, the Bible says, is the hope of glory. And this is the confusion that's going on in our daily society. This is the confusion that's going on. People don't understand. They say, do you want a theocracy? Is that what you crazy Christians want? Listen to me. The Old Testament was written to a people who wanted to be governed by God. How do we live under the rules and regulations of God? The New Testament is written to a people who had already lost society. Where we are today, society lost. It's never coming back. Our government is never going to be a theocratic, based on the Bible, government again, ever. Ever. However, when Christ comes and returns, all government will be upon his shoulders. And when he comes back, he will rule with an iron rod, the Bible says, and he will break the jaw of his enemy. But right now, it's not a theocracy we hope for. That is a society lost. That's a dream never coming true again. Now, that doesn't mean you don't do anything, vote for the right person or anything like that, but it's like Pastor Jim Coy said last year. A vote for Hillary Clinton is a vote for the return of Christ. <laughs> yeah, let that sink in a second. Here, who said they didn't get that? Well, we'll tell you about it later. <laughs> Here what you have is the turning away. It's what the Bible calls the turning away. There's a point in every person's life where they turn to or they turn away. Israel is the perfect picture of each and every human being's life. And just as unfaithful as Israel was, as unfaithful as we are, and just as gentle and giving and graceful as God was to them, He is to us. And dare we look at them and go, oh, if I was there, I wouldn't have done that. If I was there, I wouldn't have done that. 
careful. The Bible says, be careful where you stand lest you fall. I wish we did live in a theocracy, but we don't. We live in a wicked, foul, filthy society. And as my pastor used to always say, don't ever be surprised when the world acts like the world. Don't ever be surprised. There was a man of Benjamin, verse 1, chapter 9, 1 Samuel, whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becheroth, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. Now, I find no coincidence in Scripture. There was another man named Saul in the Bible who was also from the tribe of Benjamin. <laughs> Bible studiers, anybody? Who might that be? Paul. Paul. Excellent, Dave. Who have said over there? Excellent job. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel from his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Please give me your attention. Let me give you a background on the story. He starts to describe the personage of a man named Saul, the first true king, the first military leader, the first man in scripture to forge the nation of Israel. Saul was a great man. But I want to put the background here so that you understand what happens with Saul. At first, you're going to see an innocent, willing, humble man. And when power gets upon him, he becomes corrupted to a point where not many are. Remember last week we talked about the permissive will of God. God has what's called a permissive will. I want it. It's not good for you. But I want it. But it's not good for you. No, no, no. That's the man that I want. He's not good for you. No, no, no. That's the girl I want. But he's not good for you. Finally, God says, okay, you want him? You want her that bad? You want it? I will let you have it. For we all know that truly if God didn't want me to have a, a truck, I wouldn't have a truck. He'd have done whatever he needed to do. But there is the permissive will where finally God says, go ahead. And here's what we do. And here's what you're going to see all throughout these next two chapters. We do something, and we know it's wrong, and we go... God's not punishing me. He must be okay with it. Mm -hmm. Oh, ho, 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 ho. contraire. Just because we don't get punished immediately, we think God's okay with me. God's okay with my sin. God's okay. I'll tell you a quick story. My wife with me went through hell. Horrible boyfriend I was, only to be superseded by the a worse husband. Seven plus years, I put her through the ringer. When I first came to the Lord and first started to allow God to change my heart and my ways, she was blessed. Her family was blessed. Believe me, her mom and dad were blessed. And we had a friend of hers named Gina. And Gina was going through a similar problem with her husband. He was a dog. He was a cheating, conniving snake. And she had every reason to leave and didn't. She stuck in there. Well, he left her. And in the process, introduced her to a man who would try to steal her heart upon his desire so that he can blame her for cheating and he can then file for a proper divorce. Horrible situation. Some of, that, some of the stuff that went on, you're just like, I cannot believe it. And she came to my wife and said, but Joy, he's the one. My husband is terrible, but this man loves me. And my wife said, but he's not a believer. And she'd say, but look what God did with Ryan. And my wife said, oh, goodness, don't do that to yourself. You don't want to go through what I went through. But look how it turned out. And that's how some of us are with the permissive will of God. Keeping that thought in mind, continuing. Continuing. 
Verse 3, Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, Please take one of the servants with you and arise. Go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the mountains of Ephraim and through the land of Shalisha, but they did not find them. Then they passed through the land of Shealim, and they were not there. Then he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but he did not find them. When they had come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us return, lest my father cease caring about the donkeys and become worried about us. Give me your attention. Anybody not understanding? The guy's father lost some donkeys. Donkeys were a very valued thing back then. It was said that only kings rode donkeys. Horses were not as valued nor were, were uh, camels, but a, a donkey was a very special animal, and apparently some of his donkeys ran away. They went to find him, traveled about 100 miles, couldn't find him. Oh, well. He said, hey, guys, let's go back. Right at this point, I know my dad. He loves me to death. He don't care one bit about the donkeys anymore. He's going to worry about what happened to us, he said to his servant. And he said, verse 6, Look now, there is a city, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he says surely comes to pass, so let us go there. Perhaps he can show us the way that we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, But look, if we go, we shall bring the man. what shall we bring the man? For the bread in our vessels is all gone, and there is no present to bring the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered Saul again and said, Look, I have here at hand one-fourth of a shekel of silver. I will give that to the man to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, you'll notice this is in parentheses, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, Come, let us go to the seer, for he was now called a prophet, formerly was called a seer. Then Saul said to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. Give me your attention. They're going through, and the servant says, Hey, wait a second. I know this city. There's a guy named Samuel in this city. He's a seer. A seer. S-E-E-R. That is what they call them. That seer was changed to a prophet. He's a prophet. A prophet or a seer. But when you went to the seer, you'd have to give him a gift. Now, superstition versus faith. Superstition, you went to see, hey, um... I lost my donkeys. Can you tell me where they are? What do you have to give me? Um, one fourth. Is, he'd given me. That used to be a way. But the seers got chased out of the land, some of them, and the prophets of God, especially Samuel, he took over. Now, when you went to see Samuel, you didn't have to bring him a gift, but that was the tradition in the land. Oh, we don't have anything for the seer. Now they were going to go. Maybe he can help us find our donkeys. You know, almost like a psychic friends. You dial a phone number and immediately they charge you a... Uh, a dollar a minute for the first 10 minutes and then eight dollars thereafter. And then when you get your phone bill, you see what the seer charged you. Verse 11. As they went up to the hill to the city, they met some, met some young women going out to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? And they answered them and said, Yes, he is here, just ahead of you. Hurry now, for today he will come to this city, because there is a sacrifice of the people today on the high place. Please, again, real quick, give your attention. The high place is where they made sacrifices because there was no temple there. A sacrifice was given once a day, sometimes once a week, sometimes once a month, depending on the city, to atone for the sins of the nation of Israel. If you had sins, oh, yeah, I have sins. We as Christians, we take for granted that all we have to say is, God, will you forgive me? And he goes, absolutely. A Jew, in order to get forgiven of his sins, he had to sacrifice. He'd have to take a lamb, a ram, a goat, an ox. He'd have to take it up to the high place where the prophet was or the priest, and they would sacrifice, <sighs> forgiven, go back, do it again. Verse 13, as soon as you come into the city, you will surely find him. But before he goes up to the high place to eat, for the people will surely find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will, I'm sorry guys, not eat until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice. After those who are invited will eat, now therefore go up, for about this time you will find him. So they went up to the city. As they were coming into the city, there was Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. You guys are all understanding. You're going to see the guy. He's on his way up. He's going to make the sacrifice. What's this whole eating thing? Listen, after they sacrifice to God for their sins, 
and their sins were atoned and they pulled out the inerts, the lobes and the fatty this and they burn it up to God, up in smoke with their sins go, guess what they do? Barbecue. They'd eat the rest of the stuff and have a big party, drinking, having, dancing and praising God. That's what Jews did. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. You shall anoint him commander over my people Israel, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry has come to me. Now this is the way that God's ultimate plan works out. Whether it's good for us or bad for us. We tell God what we want. We tell God what we want. And God says, and don't quote me verbatim, he doesn't say this, but this is what he does. He goes, you know what? I could accomplish two things at once. Not only can I give the people what they want and teach them a lesson, but I could set them free at the same time. Now, it's the funniest thing in the world how he does this. Stay with me. Focus in, please. I know I'm, I'm getting wordy and long, and it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse when it comes to that. But listen, when God puts you in a trial, do you know why he does that? To set you free. What? That doesn't make any sense. Watch. Imagine if I had pebbles and I lined them up by size and the biggest ones are here. And I pick this big one up and I throw it at Matthew. Boom! Hits him in the head. Ow! Then I take the next one. Boom! And I go all the way down to the little ones. By the time I get to the little ones, he'll use his head to block them. That's how it is. There was these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He put them in a furnace. And you know what was burnt off when they were in the furnace? The only thing that was burnt off was their bonds, their ropes that bound them. When God puts you, it's because he's trying to set you free. You stop worrying. How many times does he rescue from one thing or another? Bounce check? What's that? I've had my account closed and seized by the IRS. That don't mean nothing to me. You had your accounts closed and seized? Yeah. Now I bounce a check. Oh, well. <laughs> Leah bounced a check. You know what happened? You'd hear her scream from where you live. <laughs> so maybe God's got to teach you a this. No, no, I'm just, I'm just, teasing. just kidding, just kidding. Here, God speaks to Samuel and tells him, I'm going to send you the man that I've chosen to forge this nation into a real army. I'm going to send you. Now, the crazy thing is, I don't know how God does that whole thing, but in the Old Testament, the way it's depicted, you'd think that God was sitting on his shoulder and whispering in his ear, okay, tomorrow about that. He doesn't do that. He didn't do that then. He doesn't do that now. Somehow, in prayer and, and studying the Bible and fasting sometimes, God gives you these thoughts and ideas, and it all just, you guys have heard me say, it's like, you ever have that little kid's game where they're little tiny pills and you put the pill in water and once the pill melts, there's a sponge inside and just, it's like you take it out of water. Wow, that was a little pill. That's how it is with God. You could be sitting there and all this little thing comes in you, but it just expands and you're like, wow, I think God just spoke to me, but I got the whole thing all at once. So weird the way God speaks. And that's what he did. He was speaking to Samuel. He was saying, listen, tomorrow I'm going to send you guys from Benjamin. He's the one. Watch for him. You with me, guys? Stay with me. It gets worse. Um, verse 17. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, There he is, the man of whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Please tell me, where is the seer's house? Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place. You shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. But as for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, don't be anxious about them, for they have been found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? It is not on you and all your father's house? Give me your attention. He walks up to a guy, and, and God says, that's him. And he walks up to Samuel. Saul walks up to Samuel. He goes, excuse me, do you know where the seer is? He goes, I'm the seer. You go up to the feast. You go up to there. You hang out there. You're eating at the big table. And then he says to him, everybody's been waiting for you. And we can't wait. Me? Listen to his response. Listen to the humility here. 
And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite, the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak like this to me? Now Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the hall and had them sit in the place of honor among all who were invited. There were about 30 persons. And Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion which I gave you, of which I said to you, set it apart. So the cook took up the thigh with its upper part and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, Here it is. Which, I, which was kept back. It was set apart for you. Eat, for until this time it has been kept for you, since I said I invited the people. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. When they had come down from the high place into the city, Samuel spoke with Saul on top of the house. They arose early, and it was about the dawning of the day that Samuel called to Saul on the top of the house, saying, Get up, that I may send you on your way. And Saul arose, and both of them went outside, he and Samuel. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, tell the servants to go on ahead of you. And he went on, but you stand here a while that I may announce to you the word of God. Give me your attention again. He says, during the feast, I mean, can you imagine? This guy's just looking for his donkeys. He has no idea what's going on. I'm just looking for my, and then the big shot, the guy that's the big shot in all the town, the guy that everybody, says, we've been waiting for you. What do you mean you've been waiting for me? Mm -hmm. Sit and wait for you. Sit down. He puts in front of him. I mean, imagine you go to <coughs> Pollo Tropical. And they put that half a the whole half a chicken in front of you. Now, we've been waiting for you to get here. Because I might imagine him in a sermon eating, like, just eat, man. You know, they might change their mind or something like that. <laughs> and then the next day, he goes, that night, he goes back to Saul's house. In the morning, is getting up in the morning. They've been partying all night, dancing, shouting. Saul, get up! What? Come on, we gotta go. You gotta go. You gotta go. You gotta stay. You got the food. You got the drink. Now I gotta go. Now as they're walking out of town, he says, "Send your servant ahead. Go on ahead." So I want to give you the word of the Lord, because that's what a prophet always says. A prophet always says, "Thus says the word of the Lord." If anybody ever comes to you with a word from God, I have a word from the Lord for you. Especially in our churches today and even in our church, some people fancy themselves a prophet. I want to give you the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. The Lord told me to tell you, make sure it has three important things. First of all, put it up to the, to the James 3.17 test. James 3.17 is what you have to say, peaceable, pure, willing to yield, full of mercy, good fruits. If somebody gives to you the word of the Lord, make sure it's the word of the Lord. Do you have a scripture that you want to invoke in that? Or is this just you getting a certain feeling? Maybe you had Pollo Tropical too late before you went to bed last night. <laughs> and three... Make sure it's backed up with prayer. Before you tell me this, did you pray about this first? Prayer, an actual Bible verse, and James 3.17. Very important before somebody gives you the word, Lord. Chapter 10. Then Samuel took a flask of oil, poured it on his head, kissed him, and said... Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? When you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelza. And they will say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for have been found. And now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and he's worrying about you. I told you, saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you shall go on forward from there. Come to the terebinth tree at Tabor. There are three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine, and they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. After that, you shall come to the hill where the Philist where come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is, and it will happen when you come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with stringed instruments, a tambourine, a flute, a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. 
give me your attention. He's telling him all the stuff is going to go down. I want you to go here. You're going to see this. You're going to see that. Now Samuel, who is a true prophet of God, is telling him what's going on. This is what's going to happen, and this is how you know. But before he did all that, he anointed him with oil. You see how we anoint with oil? One of many places in the Bible. It's a declaration to anoint with oil, to give them power, to let them receive the word of God, to show strength, anointing with oil. That's why there's so much oil. We have boxes of oil here. We want everybody to have some oil. <laughs> Look at verse 6. One of the greatest scriptures in the, in the entire Bible. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be turned into another man. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. You will prophesy. Now, what does that prophesy? Some think it means speaking in tongues. Some think it means being slain in the Spirit. The word prophesying just means speaking the Word of God. Speaking the Word of God. Now, if they had another meaning for an Old Testament, I don't know what it is. And I haven't met anybody else that knows what it is. But something happened when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you. You will speak the Word of God and turn into another man. There's so much there. That, sec that verse is so pregnant. It's so pregnant. More pregnant than the... <laughs> More pregnant than Gabriella and Brianna. I, I, I suggest you meditate on it. <laughs> And let it be when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. So it was when he turned back to go from Samuel that God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. Now listen to me. Because of the time constraints we have, I can't do it, but I would love to tell you about how amazing it is when you finally make that decision. When somebody tells you about the Lord, and it happens in your heart. You don't have to come forward. You don't have to stand up. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing that. It's a great thing because it's an attestment to your flesh as well. But when you're changed, when somebody says, oh, I got saved. Ryan isn't one of those people. I say, praise God. And then in my head, I go, let's see it. Because when the Spirit comes upon you, you'll be changed and you'll be another man. You'll be another woman. And you will have another heart. You will have another heart. Verse 10. When they came to, there, to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. And the Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among them. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets, that the people said to one another... What is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Then a man from there answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb. <coughs> Is Saul also among the prophets? And when he had finished prophesying, he went to the high place. It happened. Even to a kid like Saul. Even to a street kid. Even to a rugged... He came to church and the craziest thing happened. The Spirit came upon him and he spoke the word of God. You ever see somebody in our church and you think to yourself, man, that guy can't be a Christian. You ever see somebody who's like, there's no way. And then all of a sudden he, start, he starts talking to the word again. You're like, that's the craziest thing. I always talk about Hector. If you guys knew Hector just a couple of years ago, from Hector then to Hector now, whew, what a difference. Only God can do this. Only God can do this. Can take a man... Take a woman. I've known some women that come to our church and their, I mean, their, their, their life is a sordid tale of promiscuity. I mean, from this man to that man to this man to this man, dancing and, and, and drugging and you name it. And then God comes upon them. And all of a sudden, God restores their purity and he restores their hope and he, and he takes away one spirit and gives them a new spirit and gives them a new heart. And they become almost like a prude. Oh, goodness, no. Don't even look at me like that. I love when God does crazy things like that. I love it. I love it, because he did that to me. 
Verse 14, And then Saul's uncle said to him and his servant, Where did you go? So he said, uh, To look for the donkeys. And we saw that they were nowhere to be found. We went to Samuel. Now give me your attention. So he gets back to his hometown. His uncle sees him and he says, Where'd you guys go? Where'd you go? He goes, Well, we went to find the donkeys. And we bumped into Samuel. What? Now you've got to understand, Samuel was the first prophet, the last judge, the first prophet. Samuel? You saw Samuel? That's almost like a Pastor Bob sighting, okay? <laughs> I was in BJ's the other day, I saw Pastor Bob, I swear it was him. He looks a lot older in person. <laughs> and Saul's uncle said, tell me please what Samuel said to you. So Samuel said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys have been found. Yeah. That's all he told you? That's it. He just, you know, he told us the donkeys would be found. And I love this too. The honesty, not only is the honesty from the scripture, but the honesty from, from Saul. He's like, I'm not going to tell this guy that I just fell into a prayer trance and prophesied and <laughs> I had to change your heart. He was kind of weird about it at first, which is what you should be. You go to church and something weird happens. What I don't like is when people come to church, they get saved, they receive Christ, and now all of a sudden they try to act like everybody else they know that's a Christian. They try to speak in a certain way and they force it. Don't do that to God. God doesn't want to take you and make you some weirdo that looks like that weirdo or that weirdo. He wants to take you and make you weird just like you are. I hate, I don't hate, but I, I don't like the whole fish thing that people put on their cars. I have fish on this car, fish on that. No, don't take your fish, your fish off your car, but I just, it makes us look like we're all like cookie. We're all the same thing. We're not. We're all fearfully and wonderfully made so different. So different. And the reality of, of, of who Saul was about to become because the Spirit of God fell upon him, the Spirit of the living God fell upon him. What happened? I saw Samuel. You saw Samuel? What did he tell you? They found my donkeys. <laughs> now, I just read you like 30 verses of stuff that Samuel said, and this is going to happen, this, and he dumped oil on his head, and he prophesied, and he fell, and he had a feast. He went through all this stuff. And, as he, uh, and I'm sure there was that same uncomfortable pause. Samuel, you saw Samuel? What did he say? <laughs> and he's running in his head. The whole hope of Israel is upon me sit at the high place and eat the food. They found the donkeys. <laughs> why? Because he's never going to believe it. That's why. I can't tell him he's never going to believe it. <laughs> it's never going to happen. Uh, when they saw that there was nowhere to go, we went to Samuel. And tell me please, what did Samuel say to you? So Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom, he did not tell what Samuel had said. Then Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mitzpah and said to the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms and from all those who oppressed you. But you have re today rejected your God, who himself saved you from all your adversities and your tribulations. And you have said to him, No, set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. Give me your attention. He makes an announcement to all the heads of the families. You are rejecting God. Let it be known. God rescued you out of Egypt, not Moses. God led you through the desert, not Joshua. All the judges you had the last hundred years, they didn't save you. The mighty hand of God saved you. And today, you're rejecting him. And let me tell you, Christian, be careful. I did not save you. Austin did not rescue your kids. Lee did not prophesy over you. God did. God did. And if you have to leave this church, you go find a Bible teaching church in another town, another city, another place. There is nothing special about me. Except for the fact that when I'm standing up here, God pours His Spirit through me to you. It's more special about that one receiving the Word than the one giving the Word. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, the Bible says. It's how you receive it. The Lord Jesus himself said that. Be careful how you hear. 
Go get everybody. Bring them all. Bring them all. Bring them right back here. And I'm going to tell you what says the Lord. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near to the families, the family of Matri was chosen. And Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore, he inquired of the Lord further. Has the man come here yet? Give me your attention. Samuel gave him specific instruction on what to do. I want you to go up here. I want you to go that there. I want you to go there. And seven days later, I want you to be here. Calls all the tribes together. He looks at all the 12 tribes, finds the tribe of Benjamin, family of Kish, the fan of Zimri, whatever his name is, and he goes, where's Saul go? He, and he, I mean, he's like, oh my goodness, excuse me, can I pray? God, the guy didn't show up. You said he's going to be here, he's not here. Where is he? God, this is really embarrassing. And the Lord answered, there he is, hidden among the equipment. What does the King James say? The stuff, right? Well, I'm reading the stuff. Among the stuff. The baggage. Where, where is baggage? Which, which version you got? Um. Teen study, New, NIV. Where, sa where, where did Saul go? He's hiding. <laughs> among the stuff. <laughs> God, where's Saul? He's right there. He's hiding you, ding dong. <laughs> so they ran and brought they ran and brought him from there. And he's still just humble, still just can't believe what's happening. Wait, guys, I'm only illustrating this because where do you see what happens? And the warning is clear and clarion to all to be careful. Be careful what happens when the Spirit comes upon you. Because although the calling of God is irrevocable, believe me when I tell you. Unless you stay humble, underneath the power of God, horrible things can happen to your life. That's why the Bible says, not many of you should desire to be teachers, for you'd be held under strict judgment. I come up here, it's with fear and trembling. Believe me when I tell you, there's a reason, there's a reason that any day that God calls me out of this thing, bye, see you, I'm gone. As soon as God says, I still fear every single day that I come up here. I am not Mr. Smooth. I'm a bag of nerves but all day long and I look at something oh, carefully there he is hidden among the equipment so they ran brought him from there and when he stood among the people he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward and Samuel said to the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? That there is not one like him among all the people. So all the people shouted and said, Long live the king! Long live the king! Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. Give me your attention. Going back, remember, he told them what was going to happen. Okay, this is your last chance. He brings the guy and he says, look, looks just like a king. Look how big he is. Look how beautiful he is. And everybody starts yelling, long live the king. Long live the king. And he goes, wait, before I do this, let me remind you what a king is going to do. Let me remind you of taxes. Let me remind you how he's going to take the best of your best. He's going to take your men servant, your maid servant. He's going to take your sons and your daughters. Remember what a king comes with. We looked at it last week. I'm going to reiterate the whole thing. Remember, you appoint a king that you have chosen to serve you instead of a king to uphold something. Again, to reiterate, if you weren't here last week, the reason it was declared to put your hand on the Bible before you were sworn into office in our country is because you wanted that person that was being sworn into office to be promising he was going to uphold the United States Constitution and the Word of God. You weren't voting for men to give you stuff. That's what's happened, though. We've now voted in people who will give us stuff. And he says, I wrote it in a book, he puts it before the Lord, and he's given it to you. Is this what you want? Is this what you sure you want? Yeah, that's what we want. That's what they want. And Saul went home to Gibeah, and valiant men were with him, whose hearts God had touched. But some rebels said, how could this man save us? So they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. Although there was some yelling, long live the king, long live the king, there was something that got him? No way. I'll never follow him. You get nothing. 
And you know what he did as a humble gentleman? Oh well, can't please everybody. So different than what you're going to see in the next three or four chapters in Scripture. Believe me when I tell you. Now, last thing is, we're finished with reading the Scripture. I'm going to give you a little bit more and I'm going to let you go. Listen to me. There's a weird exchange that happens here. It almost like there's a contradiction happening. Well, did God choose him or did God not choose him? You're telling the people they made a terrible thing. Remember, we're talking about the permissive will of God. No, I want this. No, I want this. And God says, fine, then have it. God somehow takes plan B, C, D, E, and F and makes it turn out good. But taking yourself down a road that you did not have to, when plan A could have been so beautiful, could have been so wonderful. Now, well, what about Saul? Was he not chosen? Listen to me. Now, this is the key, and this is where we're going to close. Not every man who is exalted by God is exalted in a blessing. For some men, God exalts to expose his shame. Do you understand that? We look at men who have giant churches, men who have giant ministries, men who have big cities and lots of money, rich and famous, and we think to ourselves, God's with them. Look what God gave him. Look what God did to him. Look what God did for him. Be careful. God, the Bible says in just a few chapters, Samuel, I'm not like you. I don't look at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. I have chosen for myself. You'll see, just a few chapters, God will say to Samuel, I have now rejected Saul and chosen David. David, a man after my own heart. Be careful with the bigger is better thinking, guys. Be careful. Let's pray. Thank you for your word understanding of your word. God, thank you so much. And I pray that your word would sink deep into the hearts of those that heard it tonight, that received it gladly and received it well. And I pray that you would take scriptures tonight, God, and, and put it in people's hearts and minds as a reminder of, of how much you love them and how gracious, gracious your light and your love is for them. And God, I do again pray that you would seal the message that you wanted for your people here. God, we thank you and we love you for your word. May we learn everything, for your word is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing, dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thought and intent of the heart, and your word declares that we are naked before your word. We must give an account someday for every idle word we speak. So may we speak your word boldly. Bless us, God, and thank you so much. And if there be anyone in here whose heart was touched to salvation, may they make that decision with you. If there be anyone in here who, is, who, as your word declared tonight, would be given another heart, would be changed into another woman, another man, may your spirit do that. And may they willingly now, even as I say it, may they open your spirit. And just, just like a, a baseball fits into a catcher's mitt, God, may your spirit sink deep into their heart now. Save the lost. We ask it in Christ Jesus. Amen.